Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Angry Nation podcast with me, your favorite angry American. Uh, as you guys can see, we're kind of I'm solo today. Well, quasi solo. None of the guys are here. This is pre recorded for those of you watching. Uh, I've got to get some of these in the can so when we're traveling and stuff, uh, we can still get these up for you guys. Uh, so while the while none of the guys are here today, uh, I do have uh, my buddy Toolman Tim with me today, man. How the hell are you doing, brother? Good angry. Man, I got to tell you, that is one sexy intro right there, brother. I like that. <laughs> that is pretty slick. A good friend of mine made that for me, and I've always liked it. Um, oh. How are things up in the great white north, man? I know uh, you're probably different conditions than what I'm experiencing down here in the balmy shores of Florida. Absolutely. Well, as far as the great white north, you got one of the two right. It's definitely white right now, but it ain't very great. So yeah. the uh, the way... <laughs> So where, where, is this PG? Or are we where are we at with oh, this? You're, you're, uh, you, you're good to go, man. Whatever you got to do. All right, no, it's just. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen our brother Justin Trudeau up here, so that that that's where uh, the, the the. Yeah, not to go head into politics because that ain't my shtick, but it ain't real great up here. Let's put it that way. So. Yeah, no, you guys are. Uh, it's well, it, it seems to be universal at the moment. People everywhere are crazy, you know. Um, <laughs> It's it just people everywhere are crazy. They're, they're they're allowing things to happen to them and be done to them. They would have never allowed the past, never stood for. It. But now they're everybody's eager to roll over and you know whatever uh, the state wants. It seems like so it's just before little... I went live. They uh, they announced uh, the anti hate speech law up here. That's uh, oh but anyway, yeah. It it is what yeah. it is, and you wonder why we bought land in Tennessee. Let's put it that way. Well, the, the, and the problem with laws like that is who defines the speech? That's the catch. That's Brother, the catch. I'm who telling you. says it's hate speech? Whoever's in power. And uh, as long that, as you got 50% plus one vote, you get to beat everybody else with a stick, and that becomes a problem. That's that's democracy for you. The, the majority <laughs> trampling on the rights of the minority. So, you know. So true. Yeah, we, uh, that's I, how I did a, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, so that's how it usually goes. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we got a little lag there on my part. That's because we're we're up here, so everything goes through pigeons. Um, I, in Canada, so if you, <laughs> anytime we get a signal, so if, if anybody wonders why there's a bit of a lag, it's 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 either that or Santa's going overhead, one or the other. Are you so, uh, are you um on Starlink or do you guys have? Terrestrial no, I've got yeah. pretty damn good. Uh, um, I guess well, it's it's DSL. The, okay. we, we just got fiber in town. And uh, which is great. I'd love to have it, but uh, not enough people on my street signed up. (laughs) So I called the dude and I'm like, what's it going to cost? And he's like, I can put it in for $7,000 for you. And I was like, oh man, that, you know, (laughs) (laughs) so I had to wait. We're going to wait a bit. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have a a a nice day. Yeah. There was a a Swedish company that came around out here where I live because we're in rural Florida and, uh, they go around putting fiber into underserved communities, as they put it, and, and wonder if we'd sign up. And I was just, he, as soon as he said fiber, I was just like, yeah, sign me up. He's like, well, you haven't even heard. I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, if you're right. in fiber out here, I'm in. Because right now, there's only one option out here. Um, and if someone builds a new house on my road, they don't get internet because there's not enough actual pairs in the cable anymore to give anybody else internet out here. So I have terrestrial internet, but I also have Starlink here. And I run it as well, but because it could be a problem to get, you know, when you live remote, it's something people don't think about when you, when you live in remote mm. is, is the you know, ability to get on, get online is, is probably the biggest thing today, but uh, I hope they put the fiber in out here. Hell, I'm ready. Let's do it. But yeah, I signed up without the guy even telling me what it costs. I'm like, I don't care what it costs. <laughs> I'm I'm down with it. We 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 own a couple of rental properties here. My son lives in one. I can see it. I could hit it with a rock, and he's got fiber there. So I said, "Well, what's it going to cost to put it under the city street?" And, and the, it was even more. So I was like, "You know what? We'll wait just a bit." But I got Starlink for when I travel. We got a, a remote cabin, kind of a. Uh, I, I I hesitate to use the word compound. It's going to be a family property down there, bunch of cabins and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, we're. Go. Uh, I got Starlink for down there. There you go. Yeah, I like the Starlink. I'm I'm pretty happy with it so far. Um, you can't always stream off of it though. I'll warn you that now. You can't stream necessarily always from it. I've but, uh, I've had guests that have come on multiple times over the years, and it seems to have gotten slightly better. the The first, I, my one good buddy from Washington, when he was first on it, it would just it would skip for 
30 seconds yeah. and now you know yeah. maybe every five minutes you'll get a little skip so yeah it's i mean the latency is a lot better now than it was so but uh it's uh, it's incredible what technology is doing but so we're right before we came on here uh you you threw a new term at me and i never heard and i and i really like that let's 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 talk about that because i think this is something a lot of people don't think about um uh, when and they're in their prepping space and I think they should. Yeah. And you and the the the, uh, the handle you hung on it was cool to me because it's kind of sticks in your head a little bit. So let's. Uh, it let's is. Share what... I really need to. Uh, I really need to copyright it or not really, but I'm just. I love the idea of it. So for me, you know, I said many years ago, my wife and I, we came. Uh, we were broke, poor, and I always said that. Uh, you know, motivation oh, comes hey. from abject. Oh, we got somebody. There we are. Yeah, hey. T showed up. All right, guys. So we're not all alone. Now we got T and Toolman Tim. Yo. What up, T? T? Of course. I didn't see you down there, man. Jam. I don't know when you popped in. Uh, just a little bit ago. We're good, man. We're good. I was situating. I was running a little behind. So, so. Uh, That's all right. Yeah. So I'll go ahead. Go ahead. I'm interested to hear what what Tim's yeah. got to say, man. Yeah, this uh, sure, man. He, so. He, I like his I like his handle for this this term he made, so I, I dig it. Let's talk about this. So this is what I'm going to be talking about at Mountain Readiness as well. But uh, re- nice. so the, ter- the term is repairedness, and what it is is the art of home maintenance when help isn't around the corner. It's all about there being you your own damn handyman. And for then where this came from for us, my wife and I, we have five kids, and at one time we were surviving off of about eleven hundred dollars a month, and so. Wow. Yeah, there, there is nothing better for abject poverty, uh, for motivation than abject poverty. And so yeah, if, yeah. If, I, if I needed the oil changed, I had to figure it out. If I needed the new weed whipper, I had to scavenge one from the dumpster at the hardware store where I worked. And I would figure out how to rebuild a carburetor on my wife's dining room table because I couldn't afford to hire yeah. somebody. So I turned it into, I mean, it was a lifestyle for us. You know, I became, and then I became Toolman Tim. And I started a handyman business called All Seasons Maintenance. But my real passion has always been prepping. We didn't know what it was called at first. We just knew we kept a closet full of toilet paper because we wanted to make sure our kids always had toilet paper. You know, even mm-hmm. we, we bought laundry soap, we bought food because we had two rules. The light stayed on and the kids got fed. And so that's where it all started from. And then I turned it into an entrepreneurial venture where I am you know, made a lot of money doing this, teaching other people how to do it, which was great. And so then I realized, you know what? There, everybody has their niche within prepping, of course. And there's a few underserved ones. And one for me was home maintenance because here's the deal: ninety-five percent of the time, a feller's going to bug in, right? Because you've got all your shit uh-huh. at home. So now the grid goes down, or a hurricane. You know, heaven forbid, a hurricane comes through and. You, you're cut off. How long is it going to take to get a roofer to come and put a tarp on your roof? Or how long is it going to take to get yeah. somebody to come and do something as simple as board up your windows? So if you can't handle that kind of stuff yourself, all of a sudden your bug in location, instead of being an asset, becomes a liability. Or you got a deep well pump and you don't know how to pull that pump. Number one, you should probably have a backup on hand if you can afford it. And if you've never pulled mm. a deep well pump, and it's not easy, I'm not saying it is, but man, even if you got to hire somebody, hire them to say, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to pay you. I'm going to assist you. If you're not cool with that, I'll hire somebody else. But I really need to learn how to do this. And most dudes, as long as you're not a total yep. dickhead about it, are going to be willing to sit there and answer your questions. They might even charge you a little more because you want to help, but it's, yep. worth, <laughs> it's worth the investment. So, I mean, food, water, any of that stuff is great. But if you if you can't secure your castle, what kind of situation are you in? Well, you're talking just in the grid down sense of the phrase as well. Uh, you know, hurricanes, things like that. In this day and age that we live in, uh, that's pretty much so the norm now, trying to get somebody to show up at your house uh, to do any type of repair that is on time, uh, reputable. Uh, in this day and age, I think I think you're looking at more of if you've got a heartbeat and you show up, you know, you got the job because it is just that hard to find anyone uh to to show up and and do do work for you anymore and that's that's in any business anymore 
I would yeah, say the, the, that pl one the pandemic really sure. put the whammy on us. I said the pandemic really put the whammy on us as far as like services like that, you know, and getting people out. Uh, and and you're still hearing about people complaining that their companies want them to come back to their offices to work. <laughs> Nobody wants to go to work now. For me, I, one of the things I teach in repairedness is, uh, yeah, I always joke. I use the term Rolodex. Ain't nobody had a Rolodex since 1984, but you want to yeah. you want to have a good collection of professionals that you can call mm -hmm. because there the whole lone wolf mentality. No matter how you look at it, it, it ain't gonna fly. And so, no. number one, it, okay. For instance, I do property management. I do a lot of property management. We've got three of our own rentals and I look after 26 altogether. So when I get a call two years ago on New Year's Eve that a tenant's heat isn't working. Now, if your heat's not working in Florida, you could probably put a sweater on and you're okay. But mm -hmm. when the heat's not working on New Year's Eve and it's minus 35, which is basically Celsius or Fahrenheit, you've got maybe an hour, two hours before shit starts freezing. So I need to have somebody that I can call that I know is going to come at one o'clock in the morning on New Year's Eve. And I did. And part of that is making good connections and making sure you pay your bill on time. Stupid little things like that so they remember. So we just had a, a section here in town, uh, or about a four-day period, where it got as cold as it's been since 1967. It was minus 46 degrees. That's without the wind chill. I had one house that froze three times that I had to go and look after. I mean, you're just minutes, right? So I ended up calling my local plumbing place seven times over that section to go out for emergency phone calls, things that I couldn't handle myself or things that I either was somewhere else or they, you know, it was an emergency. And so dude, the next time I went out of town, I bought them two dozen of the nicest donuts you could ever find. And I took them down and I dropped them off to them because number one, I legitimately, I, I'm legitimately thankful that they did that, but also I want them to know that so that the next time I call on a Sunday afternoon when they're closed and they need to come in to get me parts, they're going to help me, right? I mean, it, it's reciprocating you, value for value every time. Let let the fellers know, hey, um, you're you're appreciated. And also, you know, if I call, can you come in, right? No, exactly. And And part of what you're talking about right there is also what we're talking about that we should all be doing at this point in time, and that's building community. Those relationships is what's going to carry you through, uh, not just now, but in those future uh, uh, times of, of hardships that we are probably going to be facing more and more as, as, as we progress. So yeah, I mean, taking care of people like that, um, you know, your neighbors, whatever it may be, be building that community is gonna be the difference between making it or uh, breaking it, um, you know, yeah. cross cut saws, yeah. grid down, cross cut saws don't work so good by yourself. You know, you need somebody <laughs> pulling on both ends to make that thing work. So what you're saying, yeah, yeah, get those donuts delivered, man, because that's your that's your tribe. And I, as far as absolutely. community goes, oh, you're good. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, say, I was just saying absolutely what he said. Yeah. Because the lone wolf is the dead wolf. You know, uh, anybody that's going on that is going to be the dead wolf. That's all it's going to be. You'll be a loop. I remember, I remember years ago, we had a big dog. And I mean, he was a big dog. And uh, he decided to take on a whole pack of coyotes all by himself. And he come back, you know, three ways to dead because he tried to do it all by himself. And that's exactly what happens mm -hmm. every single time. And, and that's the thing. Like, I'm a guy. I, I've been a handyman my, you know, for a long time and I ran a business and I like to work by myself. I do. That's just me. I would, I get more shit done, you know, with uh, a mm -hmm. podcast or an audio book in my ears, but that don't mean that I don't build community because when I went down to, I, we have an off grid property in Tennessee and I went down and we had a work day where a whole bunch of, we call them delinquents. So my brand is the workshop over on YouTube and everywhere, the podcast. And so we had 18 people show up. One guy drove eight hours, him and his wife, just to come and work on our property for the day with us. You know, we fed him. We had a great wow. time, great fellowship. We had a, an awesome time. But that's where it's at, man. When you have folks that, I always joke, you, you know, you meet your imaginary internet friends in real life yeah. eventually. That's where you start building community. And also locally, too. I mean, we do, like I said, you make your connections with your, with your plumber, with your HVAC guy, your electricians. Because you need all of that. And then, of course, family and friends in your local area, too. Yeah, you got to have 
a network, you know, and you, we, we talk, we refer to human, you know, human intelligence on, on and the technical side of the house are always referring to the, the need for people. You know, you always need people, but everybody forgets that it, it doesn't just apply there. It applies everywhere, you know, and having those relationships in place before the bad days come means those people are going to be more likely to take a call from you than they would just somebody else. Like you're saying, if a hurricane comes through and blows your roof off and you need somebody to come out there and do some emergency repairs, they're more likely to take a call from somebody they know as opposed to just someone calling out of blue. So it's definitely worth it. I would, what, you, what would you say for the, for the, um, for the, the most, the three most valuable things to have in that repair kit uh, around the homestead? I'm going to go with duct tape and bailing wire. And I don't know what the third one would be yet, but those two are high on my You got to have duct a hammer, man. Wire. Something to hit it. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but. But duct tape and bailing wire, I think you can fix most things with that. Um, man, my grow. So my dad, he he was part of nine nine kids, and they grew up in a uh, an even poorer situation than I, I necessarily was at one time. Good lord! And they used to do. I mean, they used to make if they needed a, a gate for their fence, they would take an old an old tire that was wore out, and they would cut sections of rubber out, and they'd take some roofing nails, and they would nail it to the post and nail it to the gate. And that give you enough of a hinge to make it work. Yep. You know, I talk about skills versus supplies. And, dude, you got to have supplies to fix things, right? Always. You do. Yep. But here's the deal. You can have all, you know, shark bite fittings are one of my favorite things. And if folks don't know what mm -hmm. they are, they're just a push yeah. and basically a push and done, right? And I love them things. I don't care what anybody says. But if you have an entire package of shark bite fittings and don't know how to use them, what are they? Wait, you could use them for a boat anchor, maybe, you know, but yeah. if you've spent a bunch of time around plumbing and tearing things apart, you can do what I did one day when I had a nasty leak on a Sunday afternoon down in my basement, right above my hot water tank. I had no supplies at the time and I had nobody to call. So what did I do? I cut up an old bike tire tube, wrapped it around four or five times, put a couple of hose clamps on it. And you know what? I was able to limp it through until Monday morning when I could get supplies. So that's where when you take the time and it works the same on tactical, it works the same on bushcraft, on first aid. Wow. If you take the time to learn the shit, then you can turn around and improvise. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, that the the improvising skills and scrounging skills seem to be bred out of necessity. Like you said, you went through some hard times. I know T came up a hard way when he was younger. I imagine you guys were the king of scrounge when you were growing up, T. We still, I still save everything. My, my father was, um, we actually had a nickname at one of the spots that we lived at that ever, all of our neighbors that when I say neighbors, they were miles away, but they would drive by and they nicknamed dad, the, uh, the pallet man. We would actually <laughs> drive over to, uh, Springfield, Missouri. And at the tracker Marine boat company on Thursdays, you could pick up every single pallet that they had laying back there before they incinerated them all. So every every Thursday morning we were there bright and early. We would uh, load all these these pallets up, and these were nice nice chunks of wood too. I mean, we're talking about twelve foot long pallets that these uh, these uh, bass boats come in on that uh, you know like two by ten solid oak planks. You mm -hmm. know, so these things were not just junk wood. Um, we and then my job, of course, we hauled those back to the house, and you know we never one thing as kids never said was that we were bored. <laughs> because if you said you were bored, that meant you got to split wood or uh, weed the garden or worse, take pallets apart and um, stack all the lumber, any of the junk stuff that it, it, it got burned. We would saw that up and burn it and then straighten every single one of those nails. And my father to this day has about 10 five-gallon buckets full oh of, of nails that these, these fingers uh, – and a hammer straightened out, you know, so repurposing, reclaiming, recycling, that was just an everyday part of life. And that's something that people are going to have to start getting used to moving forward in the future, I think. Yeah, talking about straightening the nails. I remember uh, reading a, an account one time of back on the, you know, the, the pioneer days of when it was time to move the cabin, you burn the cabin down. So you'd go through the ashes to pick all the nails out. Because the nails are more valuable than the cabin was, you know. Uh, True, Jeff. Time to move on. I was literally talking about this yesterday. I was out working on the uh, building a shed out here to store a bunch more of. I'm a tool guy too, you know. Contracting for years, and I've got 
you know, the whole collection and assortment of, uh, of tools. And I, I messed up. My father said, Hey, you can uh, get into a trade. Uh, you'll never be out of work. So I'm a ASC certified medium heavy duty truck mechanic and in the construction business for, you know, over 20 years in both. So I have tools everywhere, but I also have a broke, well, usually a broken car and a broken home because I'm too busy fixing everybody else's <laughs> job. Um, but building this, uh, this shed the other day, I was, I was thinking to myself, I, I was actually reading about the lifespan of a man in the 1800s. And that lifespan was about 40 to 50 years old. Um, of course, you had disease and things like that that played a part into it. But I think a, a, a large part of it was just how harsh the lifestyle is when you're talking about grid down. Just I was like, what would it take to build, you know, what I just did in two days with an air, air nailer and power saws? What would I be looking at if that was all hand hewn lumber, hand sawed, hand nailed? Uh, and a lot of that stuff we did as a kid. And, you know, that's something to think about for your preps. Um, people are looking into how to make my bug out bag three ounces lighter. But what yeah. about how to repair things around your home? Do you have hand tools? Do you know how to use those hand tools? <laughs> you know, that's another part of this. 100%. I, yeah, I mean, I, a lot of times folks, you know, sometimes there's a lot of simpler answer, you know, people say, well, how, how am I going to drive a screw when the power's out? Well, you don't hammer a nail instead, you know, that's way yeah. easier. So you know, taking some time, but like you said, getting comfortable with the stuff and having, having a good quality, like for me, I, I'm a handyman still, I do mainly property ma maintenance, but I've got a, a plumbing bag and a handyman bag that go with me everywhere. DeWalt bag, they weigh about 50 pounds a piece. And they've got all the gear and it's all been, you know, battlefield tested because I, if, if uh -huh. something breaks or it don't do the trick, it don't stay in that bag very long. So I know right now. And so when I go down to Tennessee, this is a funny story about not buying quality. So I don't like taking my stuff across the border because if I take a bag with me like that, uh, my handyman bag, I'm going in a work truck. All of a sudden they ask all kinds of questions. Oh, you going down to work? You do, you know, and I, and I get it, whatever. So I said, I'm this last time I was going to buy myself, build my own tool bag for my property in Tennessee. Well, I decided to be cheap and that's a stupid thing to do. So I went Always to Harbor is. Freight and I bought Always all is. this power gear. The minute I bought it, I, I should have just turned around and took it back. I might as well have just, I, I don't, it might as well have been cardboard. I mean, I like some Harbor Freight stuff. Well, Frick, anyway, that shit will stay in my uh, storage unit down there this time. All my DeWalt stuff mm -hmm. and all my hand tools are going with me because, man, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, not having my tool bags like not having my neck knife. Like you just you feel almost naked. So, no, yeah, buy back, once, back when I buy once, once. It, yeah, buy once, cry once. I'm firmly in that camp on tools. But when I was doing industrial electrical work, I was a tool snob. You know, I, sure. I did electrical work, so I had to have, I had fine tools and Milwaukee. Had to be Klein. I knew I knew that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> had to be kind and uh and like i said all my power tools were milwaukee so all my cordless stuff was milwaukee and uh, i was a bit of a snob about it. now i finally just finally yielded after all these years and bought my first set of dewalt tools uh not too long ago um so now i'm in the dewalt cordless stuff because i'm not working for a living no more so i can use a cheaper quality tool <laughs> see you had to go there i do that all day long i can't i can't do it you know i was <laughs> And we're all in the same spot, too, because I remember when um, you remember when Makita was king. I mean, I do. Oh, yeah. I remember when Makita, oh, yeah. you know, I had an 85 foot long battery sticking out of the bottom. 9. Of it. It 9.6 volt. 9.6 yep. volt. It would last for yep. about 9.6 seconds before it was dead. You know, that was the yeah. awesome tool. And then DeWalt come in and they started killing it. And then, of course, Milwaukee come in and they really... I still stick with Milwaukee. That uh, M18 fuel uh, brushless is as good as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, another uh, thing. Good tools. Another thing for preppers is standardization. So uh -huh. whether whether it's on your favorite caliber, you know, whether whether it happens to be, you know, for me, I, I like uh, narrow mouth mason jars. I'm just foolish that way, you know. So everything so that I'm standardized, I have all the lids right. I look at battery platforms the same way oh, because yeah. it's stored. 
you have all this stored energy you don't necessarily think about that you can tap into, right? So once you're into a platform, to me, it really doesn't matter whether, I'm going to say this and it'll sound like sacrilege, but whether it's Ryobi, whether it's Rigid, whether it's Milwaukee, or whether it's DeWalt. I know, I know. But more importantly is that you standardize something so that you always have the same batteries, the same gear, so that you don't have to think about it. You're also, you imagine like, you know, having 17 different cordless brands and 17 different tools, again, making it simple, making it a standardized system. Now that doesn't mean that if you see a Milwaukee tool that you like, go and get it if you want to, but they sell these little adapters that you can buy for like 20 bucks on Amazon that you can snap into a DeWalt or snap into a uh, Milwaukee and it'll let you run a DeWalt or Milwaukee battery. So you don't have to buy a whole bunch of new batteries. You can just adapt them to your present platform. So basically, it's the it's the equivalent of transgenderism with your with your hundred percent. What that yep. is, you just <laughs> snap it, you I become didn't. something else. No, nah. I didn't know. I didn't know they making adapters like that, but that's a great idea. That's that's really that's great. It is. Idea. It is. We we don't oh, have great Harbor, too. We don't no, have Harbor Freight in Canada, and so I went and bought some of the Bauer stuff that I couldn't get just because I wanted to. And so the first thing I bought was a Dewalt adapter, smacks on the bottom of it. And now I don't need any Bauer batteries. I just run Dewalt batteries on the Bauer tools. And, uh, you know, it doesn't change the color of them, but it changes the performance a little bit. Yeah, right. A little bit better right. quality battery. Yeah, I could see that. Well, standardizing all that stuff, too, is great. I've got, um, you know, I've got all the, the stuff. I've got the drills, the drivers, the impacts, the lights, you know, all that. And it's really nice. You, you keep that all uh the same across the board i'll go on a trip or if we're if we have some bad bad weather coming through first thing i do is throw all my batteries on the charger all the same stuff get them all to to the top which i, I always have someone but I, I make sure they're all topped off and uh mm -hmm. there's been we, we've lost power for you know five seven days before and having that extra light is uh is a godsend I build a little solar system. Uh, it's just 200 watts. It sits on the top of my storage container right next to my, what I call the workshop. And so in there, I've got four deep cycle batteries and inverter. And for the last five years, I've uh, four years probably, I've charged my DeWalt batteries 100% off the solar. But I also have it, so I put an inline plug in the feed to the garage. So if the power goes out, all I got to do is unplug one, plug the other one in, and I can run my my LED lights, I can run my battery charger and I can run my natural gas furnace out in there. So I've got everything within reason that I need because the other cool thing is 100% of my tools are cordless, even my chop saw. My seven and a quarter inch chop saw is a uh, battery powered. And for me, that works. So I don't need any, uh, a ton of extra power out there. And so I can run it off solar, but I also charge everything off solar. So they stay topped up. Yeah, that's nice. And you know, a little, a little solar system like that with an inverter. You can do a lot of work with that, you know, because when there is no power, a little power is a lot of power, you know. It sure uh, is. And, and something like that with some deep cycles, I mean, that's enough to run, you know, even if it's not cordless, like a skill saw, stuff like that, it'd run that with no problem. That's more than enough system. So I used to so what do you recommend for when well, I'm, I'm sorry, give me just a second, but nah, you're what good. do you recommend for people who are hearing this this preparedness for the first time and the wheels are starting to turn in their head? How would you, what would you suggest they do to kind of get started? Like right before the lockdowns happened, I, I knew it was happening. And one of the things I did is I went to Lowe's and I bought a bunch of plywood and two by fours and like roofing paper, tar paper, screws, nails, even some plumbing parts and stuff like that. Just because I was like, what if something happens when you're locked down and you can't get out? So, you know, I had stuff to repair water lines, drain lines here you know, all that hose repair kits. I mean, we bought, I bought all kinds of stuff and just put up in case we needed it during all that time. So, so how would you suggest people get started in thinking about this and what can they do to get started on that path to, to their repairedness mindset? Yeah, man, for me, I, you know, i um, part of the presentation I do on repairedness The the title is actually baby steps. And the whole idea is starting small because if you've never you know, if you've never driven a nail in your life, you don't want to reside your entire house, you know, vinyl siding, because I mean, you could, but the problem is if you try to do it all at once, you're going to get totally lost. You know, you don't, if you've never unplugged a toilet before, you don't want to plumb an entire bathroom. 
So the idea <laughs> is, number one, take a look. I don't even want to plumb an entire, or I mean, I will, but I hate doing it. But, you know, so number one, take a look yeah. at your skills, know where your level's at, and, and like anything, incremental improvements, right? So I use the bathroom one as an example. So if you've never plunged a toilet, well, the first thing you're going to do is going to go on YouTube and you're going to watch a video and probably somebody failed you in your life if you haven't learned how to plunge a toilet, but that's neither here nor there. You're going to go on YouTube and you're going to learn the proper way to plunge a toilet because that it, there is a proper way, you know? So once oh, yeah. you learn that, you might say, okay, now the next time when I have a dripping water line behind my toilet, I'm not going to call a $150 an hour plumber. I'm going to go to YouTube university and I'm going to watch it. And then, you know, maybe six months down the road, your wife says, you know, I really want one of those fancy dual flush toilets. And then you roll your eyes because you're like, oh, here comes work for me. But instead of calling a plumber, you're going to look it up again on YouTube because now you've done a little extra. You're a little more comfortable with the tools. You're going to see what do I need? And you're going to realize to take a toilet up off the ground is really just using a wrench. If you can take those two little nuts off the bottom that and disconnect the water line, now, you know, watch the video so you don't spill water everywhere and you're going to have wax underneath of it that's going to be messy, but it's not a difficult proposition. And putting it back together, you're just reversing the process. So then you might look at doing a sink or, you know. So for me, what I always tell people is don't start too big because the people who get discouraged or overwhelmed are the ones who go from, again, plunging a toilet to plumbing an entire house. If you try to do that all at once, you're not going to do anything. So start small, but always be willing to stretch a little bit. You know, always look at whatever the next the next skill is that you want to learn that's maybe 10% harder than what you've done. And if you do that, man, I one of my life mantras is 1% better every day. And if you go 1% better every day, at the end of the year, you're 3,800% better. I've taken that approach with my podcast, with my YouTube channel, with my handyman business, and even with our financial situation. And when you do incremental steps like that, that's when all of a sudden somebody asks you, man, how do you know all this stuff? Well, because I've spent the last 10 years just getting a little better at it, right? Yeah, I like that. One percent. One percent better every day. That's an awesome way of looking at it. I agree. Something else to, to think and factor into that is, is, is being in the construction business for many years, um, I, I tried to drift into a whole lot of different areas as I moved along. You know, started out in masonry. And then the masonry ended up into framing and then framing went into roofing and siding and, and windows and decks. And then finally, you know, additions and you just keep building on this as you move along. But um, justification for buying tools, you know, to do these type of projects, you need tools. You know, the fingers yep. only get you so far. And so as you start building on this, like Tim said, you know, we start out with, uh, you know, changing a, a, a drip on the toilet, then we're switching the toilet out, then we, we keep moving on and on. Start factoring in the cost of your tools into this. Don't just go out and buy a whole bunch of crap, okay? Because it's gonna cost you a bunch of money, you're gonna be disappointed, mm -hmm. you're not gonna know how to use half the stuff. So when you're doing that toilet, factor in, okay, I wanna, maybe I want a spanner wrench, maybe I need a pipe wrench, maybe I need some, you know, uh, a couple plumbing tools and factor those in to where you're not getting that huge cost all up front um, and you're using those tools for that specific job um, and, and they pay for themselves. You know, not a, it's not a hundred and fifty dollar plumber coming out there per hour. You buy twenty dollars worth of tools and the parts that you need and you do it yourself. Now you're now you're adding to that tool collection a little bit at a time. Yeah, and, and you will grow it over time. Like now, my tool collection now even has a pneumatic uh, fence stapler. Right. Because I got tired of driving Actually, fence yeah. staples, which is something I hate that more than anything, trying to drive fence staples. And when I found a pneumatic nailer, I was like, done, bought it immediately. I mean, it was almost 500 bucks. There's something, there's something worse, time. though. Um, Joyce uh, Hanger nails. <laughs> Joyce Hanger nails. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I, that nailer, that nailer is worth its weight in gold, buddy. I'm telling you. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But that being able to shoot the fence down and not there trying to get staples set because I had the the setting tool. I don't know if you ever see you drop the staples in like in a magazine, and there's a big mm -hmm. plate up there that you hit, and when you hit that, it sets the nail. So you ain't got to sit there try to hold it and get it to sit in the fence. I thought that thing was fantastic. And then I saw the pneumatic nailer, and I was just like, oh, yeah, that's kind of a no-brainer. I'm getting that. 
because it makes you can do so much yes. more work so much faster you know i mean it's a fraction of the time to go clunk as opposed to sitting there trying to tap that damn thing in and then swinging that frame and hammer to drive that two inch staple you know so yes. yeah you know by, I watched by the video. buying the tools as you need them you're learning exactly what you need and you won't like you said earlier you won't waste money on a bunch of stuff you don't need either so that's it that's it and there's, you know, you talked about going into uh, different fields, kind of learning as you go along. And I got kind of lucky. Back I uh, when I finished university, I took a very prestigious job working the night shift at Dairy Queen. And from there, I ended up getting offered a job at a local hardware store. The guy liked me and he's like, hey, do you want to come work? And eventually I said yes, because I figured that would be the best free education I could ever get and get paid to do it. So for the next mm -hmm. seven years, I hung around all the trades guys. Every time I needed to install a window, I was like, hey, what do I do here? How do I put these shims in here? How do I spray foam? How do I install an insert window from the inside of the house on the third story? Because my butt ain't going up that ladder. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that kind of stuff. And I learned uh, heating, plumbing, electrical, even how to assemble stuff. So I, by hanging around... so. Not everybody can get a job at a hardware store, but I want to tell you, if you go to your local, maybe, you know, some of the big boxes are okay, but the local ones, they're willing to take the time and talk to you too. So if you're not sure how to do yep. something, go in and take a picture of your sink and say, hey, th this is leaking. What is this called? You know, and they'll talk you through it. They'll say, this is how you do it. Get this part, get this tool, find the experts and kind of lean on them too. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I went into the electrical trade primarily, but I mean, I can run heavy equipment. I can pour concrete. Uh, I'm a framing carpenter quality. I'm not a finished carpenter necessarily with a little bit of effort. I can get pretty close, but you know, learn all the basic skills. And I don't know how these people today, and I, and I say it cause it's, it applies to more than one generation presently that, that lack those basic skills, you know, of being able to fix stuff and even check the oil in their car, you know, we talk about like, you know, vehicle maintenance thing, but, but home maintenance, you own a home, there's some freaking maintenance of all the next shit. It ain't cheap. You know, um, like we're getting ready to probably redo our kitchen here. That's 16,000. Oh, yeah. you know? Get that wallet six, out. Yeah. That's 16 grand right now. It's just the initial quote, you know, and I, so we know it's going to be more than that. You know, I'm figuring it's, well, to me, it's out of 20. necessity at this point. Yeah, it's, it's out of necessity as far as I'm concerned. You know, even no matter where you're at, everything that is behind me here, you know, used to not look like that. It was a big patch, wheel, yeah. patch uh, quilt of mess. And, you know, um, we could have never afforded this home if we weren't putting the work in to redo it. Um, so I, I think convenience, I think convenience is what's ruined the world today. You know, it was it, it was just not convenient. It, we were, we were told that it's better to go out and get a college degree and go make a bunch of money and just pay somebody else to do that. Be a computer programmer, be a, you know, whatever, set at a desk. Everybody wants a desk job now. Um, yeah. Nobody wants to get dirty anymore. And that's where the trades have become this uh, disappearing uh, skill. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard to find a good tradesman anymore. Well, I just, uh, I just saw a thing this morning on Twitter where they're saying, uh, like I can't remember who it was. If I said the guy's name, you'd probably recognize it. But he was just saying that, "Hey, kids, um, stop taking coding classes. You're wasting your time. AI is essentially going to replace you." So they're like, "These kids are all trying to learn coding and going into computer, you know, science, engineering stuff. Uh, AI is going to replace them." So they're already saying, "Well, that now that door's closed." Because remember, I don't know when you guys were coming up when I was growing up. That was all the thing. Go to go to college and and oh, get yeah. a computer program. Go go computer program. Computer program. That's what everybody hopped at you. Now they're saying, yeah, don't do it because AI is going to make you obsolete because it can do so I mean, much better job than humans can. Mike Rowe, uh, he's, uh, you know, everybody has a guy that they want to get on their show at some point. And he he is my yeah. white whale, you know, my, and uh, I'll have him. On, I, I've said it for four years. I will have him on my show at some point. But he has preached that gospel for how long? You know, get in the oh, yeah. trades, get in the trades, because, you know, you might be able to automate you know, in the next 20, 30, 40 years, you might be able to automate brand new home building in a cul-de-sac in a big city. You know what I mean? In a, in a, oh, yeah. you know, but you're, you're not automating somebody crawling into a crawl space and fixing a water leak, any of that kind of stuff anytime soon. That kind of stuff is good. I think at least for at least the next generation, who knows where it goes from there, but you're going to, 
yeah, you're going to, you could write your own ticket as a, as a tradesperson today. Yeah. Well, even Star Trek had maintenance guys, you know what I'm saying? Someone's got to keep this it's true. all working. It, great, it always great take people to some it. level. Yeah. You know, I mean, even Star Trek had them. So, you know, you will, you will need a human in these, in these cycles someplace, you know, there has to be a person involved. Mm -hmm. Robots simply can't do what people can do yet. Now, if they ever get them there, yeah, then we might be on a world of hurt, but uh, for now, I still, like you said, the trades to me, that's what I recommended to my kids too. Um, and none of them went to college, surprisingly, but uh, they're not doing anything I suggested they do, but, but at least they're not being saddled with student debt, you know, so they're, uh, they'll find their now, way. I think um, the bad part is, I think, in this day and age is, is the Mike Rowe is a great one. I love, I love that guy. The, 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 mm -hmm. 100% behind everything he says, but the, I think the issue is, is it's no one actually wants to do it anymore. That's, that's, I think what it comes down to, you know, I cut my teeth on the framing crew. I went to work for the Amish and I, I worked with the Amish for about eight years. Um, and, uh, that's, that's their, that's all they do. You know, if you're a, if you're yeah. a son, if you're a son, you go to work with father and that's what you do until you get married. And then you go out and you do, and sometimes they still stick together and they do that. But the family, the family unit is not that anymore. Um, it's okay. everybody just kind of goes their separate directions and they, you know, and, and we're, we're pumped full of this garbage about how, you know, like you said, computer programming and, and, uh, you know, go get all these college degrees and spend $150,000 on it. And then the next thing you know, you're working at Starbucks as a barista. You know, that's that's what um, and I see a lot of people with degrees at Starbucks. No, nothing against it. Yeah. Uh, but but that's that's what's happening. Um, I know tons of contractors currently who are just begging for young men yep. and women to come to work for them. They will pay you to train. You know, all these people, hey, go to trade school. You don't have to. Take your pick. Just nope. pit, open up the phone book to where all the contractors are, do this, and drop the finger, and boom, you got a job paying good. Yeah. And um, and you can take it from there, but that's it. No one wants to do it anymore, I don't think. Yeah, the most popular uh, job amongst, uh, like, the youngest generation right now is TikToker. Everybody – wants to be a TikToker and like they don't even understand the process of how that makes money, but yet they know that's what they want to do, you know? Oh, for us. So my wife and I have kind of over the last few years, we've turned into serial entrepreneurs and I don't mean we sell Kellogg's, but we we've opened a bunch <laughs> of different businesses. And so we started with the handyman. Then we went into the property management. Then I built the content creation and now we're in the process of opening our third daycare. And one thing I will tell you is, you know, we, we pay well, we pay well above market value, but uh, we're, so we're in the process, like right now, we're within a couple of weeks open the next one. My wife has, I, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but she's probably, she's interviewed 10 or 15 people over the last month. And half the people that she's hired have either called the day they were supposed to start or showed up for one day and didn't come back. But most of them just ghost her. And it's not for a, um, you know, an inhospitable work environment. It's a great place. The people that work there are awesome. It's just, I mean, and, and, you know, I want to say it's young people, but we've had a couple, you know, in their forties or early, almost 50 who have just, you know, it's like, they know they, they need to work. They know they need the money. They get nervous. They're like, Oh, I got to do something, you know? And then, so they go through the interview process, they accept the job. And then they called the night before or two nights before with some bullshit excuse. I'm not going to be there. I can't. And then sometimes it'll be three, four days where they just don't show up because they're sick. But most of them just, they have some excuse. Ah, it's just not going to work or I'm not going to do it. And you're like, okay. And it's never, I found another job. It's just, I'm not going to bother coming to work. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what broke in the world between March 13th, 2021 and today. I don't know what it was, but something broke and people just, you can't get folks to come to work. And it is the weirdest thing. I i love money. I won't lie. I love making money, man. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there's something to that 5G thing, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe it's cooked. Up. I don't know. Maybe it, that's all I can figure out. 
Mm. F5G is cooking their brains, turning them to mush. F5G cooked, smoked everybody, man. That's we. I had the same problem. You know, I, I was a, a regional operations director for a company in transportation. We did the heavy truck and trailer maintenance. And uh, I've got 26 years as an ASE certified uh, diesel tech. And um, same thing, grown, grown men show up to the job and next day they're gone and you try to call them if they do answer they're like no i just didn't know i didn't know the job was going to be that hard i can't even count how many times i was told you know by guys doing doing road service now everybody knows what road service looks like you're on the side of an interstate you're picking up tires that weigh as much as you do you're out there covered in dirt and mud and sweat and, and diesel fuel and you're going to tell me I didn't realize it was going to be that hard. I had a guy quit me one time, and and when I called him the next day, he said he took another job. I said, well, did they pay you more? He said, no, I took a pay cut. I said, well, where are you at? Where did you go? He said, I went to Starbucks because they have air oh conditioning. Oh, my God, because they have air conditioning. They have air conditioning. Yeah. He took an $8 an hour pay cut. Yeah, well, you know. I remember dudes Mind coming into the trades back when I was doing electrical power plants and when I was doing heavy industrial in particular. And you'd see, like, I remember we hired a kid out of Wendy's because he was uh, one of the foreman's, like, nephew or grandson or some shit. And uh, he'd come out of the job, and and you could just see he was not prepared for what he walked into, you know. Because <laughs> um, by, by the second day, he could barely walk. Brand new work boots were kicking his ass. Um, but... I guess to us, to me, you know, I did it out of pure necessity. I needed a decent job that would pay decent money. And the trades is where I could get that. And that's that's why I went into electrical work. Um, and, yeah, it was hot and miserable at times. And at sometimes really, really so. But it's just it is what it is. And you got to deal with it. You know, it's people they act like, well, we have an option. We If I don't choose not to deal with that, I don't have to. I just I just saw a video on, the other day of this young guy. He's probably in his. 1920 and he's in some kind of little store i don't know what kind of store it was there's supposed to be five people on shift but somebody called in there's only four people on shift and he's in the stock room of the store crying about how hard his work day is that he's having to deal with so many customers and then i was watching that video thinking about you know when you'd pick up that six inch galvanized rigid conduit and have to carry up 15 flights of stairs you know that's a hard job. <laughs> you know, hey, dealing with somebody at a retail establishment is not a hard job. I don't, I don't care what you're selling. I So one of, another one of our mantras or one of the things that we live by, and one of my pillars of preparedness is entrepreneurship. So having some sort of control over your income, your scheduling, your lifestyle. And it doesn't mean for everybody a full-time entrepreneurial venture. You know, even, even a side hustle that makes you 10 or 20% of your money is going to be great if your boss had a bad weekend with his mistress and he come in Monday morning and fired you because all of a sudden you can scale that up because guess what? You got 40 extra hours that you can go and do something with. Yeah. But uh, so I was born in 1981. I grew up identifying as a Gen Xer. They they try to tell me I'm a millennial now, but I'm a Gen Xer. That's what I was. That's who I was. And, you know, my dad, he tried to teach me all this stuff that we're we're talking about tonight, and I had no interest. I was going to go to college, and you know, so I went and I did my Bachelor of Arts in Comparative Religions. I mean, it was a, you know, and I put that immediately oh, to use by working. Yeah, I know, right? And I put that immediately to use by working at a Dairy Queen. I told you, right? I mean, yeah. stupid yeah. decisions, right? And yeah. all of a sudden, I hit about, I was 23, 24. I get that job at the hardware store. And all of a sudden, I realized, damn it, all that stuff dad was trying to teach me, he was smart. So then I yeah. go back to him. and I'm like, dad, you want to show me this stuff? And so I've tried with my kids. It's a long way to say that I've tried really hard to teach them the stuff that I, not that my dad didn't try, it's that I didn't listen, right? So you know, even simple, stupid little things like my daughters knew how to do laundry at seven. You know, my my older daughters can change her oil, change her tire. My my daughter, Grace, called me the other night. It was about 1030 at night. She's like, Dad, can we FaceTime? I'm like, yep. Said my furnace isn't working. So we 
she, I mean, she's, what is she, 20? I'm going to get it wrong. 23, maybe. I'm not sure. Right right around there. And we we sent and we troubleshooted her entire furnace, checked all the parts, and it turned out that her igniter was bad. So we had to call in an after hours guy. But she, she spent a half an hour. She was so proud of her little headlamp that I got her for Christmas. And she did everything. She listens. We do think, you know, she knows how to troubleshoot. And I, like the millennials, the wherever you want to go in it, I I might be I'm a little bit optimistic maybe about the Gen Zs because they've seen all the bullshit that they've had to deal with with all the the the, the generation yeah. coming before them, and I I see this small entrepreneurial spirit not in it not in all of them I will say that but I do see some of them who are like and you know we do joke about kids wanting to be a TikToker I get it but at some point AI and automation is going to get rid of a shit ton of jobs. And so yep. we're going to be in a, what I call a creator economy or, or something like that. So whether you write books, whether you teach people how to do repairedness, whether you, you know, podcast, or if you can figure out a way to monetize it, that might be your goal to independence. It not necessarily, and don't, don't make that your plan A, but having that kind of stuff. So that, that's kind of where I see this entrepreneurial spirit coming in those younger generations are, Hey, I got to get my hustle on. And if I want to make money, but I don't want to go to work, you're still going to have to work, but you got to figure it out. And it's never going to be all of it. But I kind of hope because, you know, generation swing pendulum, you know, they go from you look at the baby boomers to the uh, the ones that came after them, you know, it swings back and forth. So I'm kind of hoping that especially the young and maybe not Gen Z's, whatever the hell they call the next one. I think they're looking at the ones before them and like, I don't want to be like that. And I hope I, I'm very cautiously optimistic that there'll be at least a good charge of entrepreneurial spirit coming out of them. Well, you're seeing a lot of videos. They're putting a lot of videos out that that, that generation you're talking about where they essentially say, uh, I don't want to work no more. I don't, I don't want to have to be, I don't want to be forced to participate in this economy that it's hard to find a job that pays a decent wage right now, especially because of inflation and things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, they're smart enough to look around and go, I'm going to invest my life into doing this. And this is all I'm going to make out of it. And, and this is going to be my life because I won't make enough money to do anything else. You know, they're finding out they can't afford to live on their own. Um, and so they're, they're really disenfranchised. And, and I think some of that may result in seeing a resurgence in the, to the trades because, Absolutely. You know, these kids, some of them are going to look around Starbucks and be like, this is bullshit. You know, I need to make better money. I mean, as a as a heavy industrial electrician, I was making a six-figure salary back in the early 2000s, you know. Um, it was hard work, but it was there to be made, you know. And so I worked. I, I looked in particular for jobs that were working seven twelfths, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. That's the shift I want. Uh, and I'd go to that job Time, and work yeah. to make that money, you know. So it's going to take the bottom falling out a little bit too, you know, mm -hmm. because right now there's still all kinds of stuff out there that you can catch handouts. And I don't want it to look, if you need help, you need help. But in this day and age, it it's hard to say, well, I just can't find a job, man. I'm yeah. telling you, it it's hard to say that at this point in time, even if yeah. you don't have skilled trades under your belt, uh, just the willingness. I mean, every place you go to has a help wanted sign, and it's the constant age old thing these past couple of years. I just can't find anyone to show up. You know, yeah. and it, it isn't even anything about money. It's about nothing. It's about I cannot find somebody to show up. I think the the handouts is, are going to have to stop in order for people to get that rude awakening. You know, and to say, oh, oh well, there's nothing. I guess a uh, big, big government isn't helping me anymore. I guess I'm going to have to go out and have to actually have to help myself. I saw an article the other day and we, you know, they talk about constantly wanting to raise minimum wage and I'm never a fan of government <laughs> getting, I know. Well, this one, this one took the cake. This was, they wanted to create a maximum wage. And I thought if you ever want to stifle innovation in a country yeah. you tell people that the maximum amount of money they can make is a million dollars and you're hooped mm -hmm. i mean i i you know i i've had you on my show before chris and um and, and yours your collapse was an emp but i think about yeah. other guys like uh glenn tate for instance his his book mm -hmm. there 299 days his was a slow collapse yeah. and it was because eventually the looters outweighed 
the producers. Mm -hmm. And you have that all the time where, you know, uh, you look at, is it Argentina right now that just, um, they, they just hired or they elected a, an anarcho-capitalist president and it's incredible. And he's in there right now. And he's like, listen, if we don't do something about this, there's going to be nothing left. Now, who's the ones yep. fighting against him? The ones that are fighting against him, and, I, you know, wherever you're at is the high, the people who are in the unions and the people who are in the government that make the high wages that have been artificially inflated over the years that aren't making what they're worth. And they know that the gravy train is going to get cut off. And if that doesn't mm -hmm. happen, like you said, something has to give because you can't, it's basic economics. You know, up in Canada, they want to do, got me on my hobby horse here, but up in Canada, yeah. they, they, they want to do a, a universal basic income. Well, where does that come from? Because all of a sudden, yeah. all you do is, all right, you know, if you're giving everybody a thousand dollars a month, well, that thousand dollars might as well not mean anything because rent's just going to go up that much because you've yep. just diluted the money pool. Everybody knows it, but people still want it to happen. And I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I think, like you said, I think the bottom has to fall out for people to get really uncomfortable. Well, too, this this idea of the living wage that that every job, apparently every job category out there is, is meant to raise a family of six. You know, um, there's I remember we consider these starter jobs when I was coming up, you know, fast food, that kind of thing. This wasn't meant to raise a damn family on. And they, they always like to use that example as the number one reason they need to do that. But I don't know too many people, at least when I was working in a McDonald's in fast food, I never worked at McDonald's, but. Um, it wasn't people raising a family. It was, it was kids like me that no. were there running those stores. It wasn't meant to be a career. That's no. that's where we went off the deep end in this stuff. Look, I was a sonic car hop, man. I had the whole roller skates and everything back in the day. I did that. But that's not a career job. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not. No. That was to get me money for the will, weekend. That's what that was for. <laughs> I will say, I'll make you some change. Things have gotten harder. Because those those minimum jo the the middle the middle level jobs some of them have disappeared you know and and yeah. it has made it a little more difficult because my dad worked in the grocery industry for a long time and it used to be that you know he started cutting meat at seventeen and he worked his way you know he just packaged meat and that sort of thing worked his way up to a meat a meat cutter meat manager and when he first started in that industry most meat departments would have three or four full time guys that could make a really good wage by cutting meat well now what they most of the big box and this i'm you know no excuses but what end up happening is they have one manager for the department and everyone else they hire is 28 hours a week not enough for benefits uh -huh. and not enough to pay your bills so you end up having a lot of these uh he dad's you know it was like 50 year old people who would have two or three of these you know 16 to 28 hour a week jobs trying to support themselves because a lot of those middle jobs disappeared and so that's why like you said the trades are good starting a business or two is great because you get to set you get to set your wage all of that you know uh -huh. so it, it but the other problem is that the youngins especially and we all do it every you know our generation thinks our problems are the worst that have ever happened and the generation that comes after us thinks oh it's never been this hard well it's always been hard dude <laughs> you know you yeah. just at some point you realize, I don't know what age it is, if it's 25, what for some people it's younger, some people it's older. Eventually you've got to realize that, you know, life sucks in a certain way and everything that happens is, is what you make of it. And once you get over it, you know, once you realize, you know, anxiety and stress and hard work is part of the deal and ain't nobody going to give you nothing, you're way better off for it. Yes, the, the sooner a bunch of folks have that realization now, the better off they're going to be because there's a bunch of folks in a bad way for not thinking that way right now. You know, we, we, the ones we were just talking about. So, Tim, what do you what do you got cut up on your travel schedule, man? I know we got a bunch of stuff coming up here in the immediate future. Where are you going to be? We are. So I uh, the last three years I've done, I guess I call it my great American road trip. And last year I did a couple of them. This year I'm just doing the one, but it's it's a doozy. It's about six six and a half weeks. I'll be down in the the U.S. and so I'll be at uh, Kentucky Sustainable Living Festival. That's toward the end of March, and then yeah. there's Self Reliance Festival, which you and I are going to both be at, Chris. And yeah. then there's the Kentucky Living Self Reliance as well. Yeah. I'll be okay. Yeah. Kentucky too. Yeah. 
Yep. Per, oh, sweet. So Kentucky, yeah. we'll, we'll get some time yeah. together, man. Maybe smoke yeah, a cigar yeah. or two if you're up for it. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got a bunch. I'll bring some. All right. I'll bring some, too. Uh, living free in Tennessee. In, uh, obviously, in Tennessee, I'll be at that spring workshop for Nicole Sauce. That's in... Uh, that's the end of April. And then the week after I'll be at mountain readiness. And in between that, I'm going to be running my ass back to the property in Tennessee to, uh, to build on the cabin, to add an outdoor shower space, to add uh, another composting toilet, and hopefully build some extra cabins all around the property. Nice. How many acres do you have over there? Uh, well, um, it started at around 10 and then we, we got offered another five. So we've, it's just over 16 acres of what I would call raw land. It was selectively cut maybe 10, 15 years ago. But other than that, there's there's been no development on it at all. Oh, that's nice. That's good. That's real good, actually, to find that. Because we're trying to decide, do we want to stay here in Florida or do we want to move elsewhere? And it's like, do we want to put the house in the market and just go travel around in the camper until we find someplace we like and then we'll start looking? Or what do we want to do? So we're trying to figure that out right now. Be careful of Tennessee. You'll fall in love. My God. The, well, the, that's the, where we're looking. But yeah, for us, I had other friends who were, uh, they they did the exact same thing. They lived in Minnesota. They got themselves an RV. They traveled around for a while. And guess what? They set up about 10 miles from where my property is. They just absolutely fell in love with Tennessee. There's something about it. The people, the freedom, the weather, and just the mindset is beautiful. I think we lost Chris. That's okay. He'll come back. He'll come back. Now, North Carolina was the same for us, man. There's something to be said for, uh, you know, the Blue Ridge, God's country. Uh, there's just room to move and breathe and and be. Our our nearest neighbor is uh, literally about a half mile down the hillside here. So, oh. and then we're butted up to sixty seven thousand acres of game land. So, you know, it's uh, and, and Tennessee, the same, you know, uh, relatively close to the same type of property I I as North Carolina. So, nope, love it. Understand completely. I don't know if we're going to get Chris back. We'll see. He should pop back up. That's all right. He just there, put a message there in the private chat if you saw that, too. So, it just asked nope, for you to, yep. you know, he said, T, can you close us out? So, I'm thinking uh, close he might have. Uh, close it out. I think the NSA well, got him. That's hey, all those clicking noises. You heard all those clicking noises. You know what's up. It happens oh, yeah. all the time. Well, Tim, sorry I didn't catch it beforehand where we could talk, but at least I got in there to the to the discussion here before before uh, the show was too far too far gone. But um, I'm sure you know what. Where can everybody find you? Your podcast, your your social media links. Where where can they get you at? Yeah. So. Honestly, you type Toolman Tim into any of the socials. You, YouTube's where I'm at. So Toolman Tim, Toolman Tim's workshop. I've got Workshop Radio as the podcast. But if you go over to YouTube, type in Toolman Tim, I come up instead of that guy from the 90s. You remember him? And uh, Yeah, that guy. So <laughs> that I've worked guy really hard at it. For uh, Coke distribution, I, that guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no. It, so just type in <laughs> Toolman Tim. You'll, we, I have um, two live streams a week. Thursday night I do this week in prepping. And Sunday night, I interview folks like Chris. I had him on a couple of years ago. I've had uh, uh, Bill Forstin awesome. from One Second After on. I had uh, Five Times August, the musician there that is, uh, you know, the the freedom dude. He's been on. So we, we do our best. And, uh, you know, tool reviews, that sort of thing. And then my big thing lately has been, so the Patch of the Month Club has been my, every, I, I believe in value for value exchange with folks. And one of the things that I realized, I asked my buddy one time, I said, how do you have so many hats? And he's like, I don't have a lot of hats. I have a lot of patches. <laughs> so I started wearing a boonie hat that has Velcro uh, on the front. And so I needed something I could send out in the mail. So I, I launched this a while ago and uh, people love them, but we end up, I send these out. So that's like a Yelp review for government. Government, zero out of five oh, stars would not recommend. Not recommend. <laughs> yeah. This is our favorite. Say this in the Dale Gribble voice. Guns don't kill people. The government does. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, this was this month. This is uh, Weapons of Mass Distraction, Fox News and CNN. <laughs> Wait. So I, uh, I like that. Yeah. So if you go to patchofthemonth.co, not .com, patchofthemonth.co, CO, and you can sign up. It's 10 bucks a month, $100 a year, and I send you out one of these cool morale patches. And so I figured, hey, I'm going to be on Chris's show this week, so I might as well do something special. So if you use promo code going home. And if you know, you know, of course. <laughs> and uh, right. so if you sign if you sign up for the monthly, I'll send you out three free patches. 
And if you sign up for the yearly, I'll send you out six free patches. So um, nice. I'll leave it for a couple of weeks. I think after, I think the show's coming up in March. So it'll be good for about two weeks after the show goes live. Cool. That's awesome. Appreciate that, man. So there you guys go. Sign up for the patch club and, and get some, some free goodies. Absolutely. T, T, I know that I'm back. You got anything you want to leave with T? It's been a good show. I liked, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of construction and tools and, you know, being a tradesman for my entirety of life. Yep. Yeah. This is a passionate subject for me. So I appreciate you, Tim, uh, coming on and, and also coming to Mountain Readiness. We're really looking forward to seeing you there. Yeah. And uh, I guess the people who are looking to become more self-sufficient in, in the, the repairedness uh, business, uh, tools and, and things of that nature, remember, are the same as your gear. You got to test it. Don't just buy yeah. a bunch of crap, throw it in your vehicle. You know how many people buy? Oh, I, my vehicle, I've got a... You know, I've got a hammer and a screwdriver and I got a tire plug kit and I've got a, um, you know, a tire gauge and I've never used it or a, or a set of jumper cables. I have no idea how to use it. It just sets in that cool little little bag that it come in. So uh, if you're going to get into this stuff, you should. It's important. And make sure you test it. Make sure you know how to use it. Yeah. Damn sure. Make sure you know how to use it. Got to pressure test it. Well, Tim, thanks for being on with us, man. And we'll be seeing you. I guess I'll be seeing you next month. And uh, absolutely, and we'll T. We'll all be together in, in harmony at Mount Readiness. So looking forward to that too, brother. Sounds good. It's gonna be a great Mount Readiness. It's gonna be a good one. Yeah, off the hook. Looking forward. To all it. right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And you guys know the drill. Until then, you know, be good. We'll be good at it.